This is chapter 9, part A, on muscles and muscle tissue. So muscle tissue makes up nearly half of our body's mass. It's a very dense tissue. Remember from the tissues chapter, we said it was unique and that it can transform our chemical energy in the form of ATP into directed mechanical energy capable of exerting force and providing movement. So some terminology to know when studying the muscles are some prefixes. So whenever you see myo, mis, or sarco at the beginning of a word, then we're talking about muscle and muscle tissue. So a lot of these terms are just kind of the muscle's own version or own name for basic cell parts. So like the sarcoplasm is just a muscle cell cytoplasm. So it's a cytoplasm like in any other cell, but we call it sarcoplasm to specify we're talking about muscle cell cytoplasm. Same thing, you might see sarcolemma, right? so that's just another name for the cell membrane of the muscle cell. So reviewing from the tissues chapter, we have three types of muscle tissue, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. So skeletal muscle is attached to the skeleton. So it is our consciously controlled voluntary muscle that we can stimulate to provide movement. Skeletal muscle cells are long, thin fibers and have very obvious stripes or striations. Cardiac muscle is found in the heart, and it is also striated, but the muscle cells are much shorter, fatter, and branching. Smooth muscle is found in the walls of the hollow organs, so like the stomach, the digestive tract, and some blood vessels. So they have no striations, so this is why they're called smooth muscle. So they have these smooth, kind of flattened, or fusiform cells. This chapter, we're going to focus primarily on skeletal muscle. We'll talk more in depth about cardiac muscle in the heart chapter. So skeletal muscle is packaged into skeletal muscle organs. So they're considered organs because they're composed of different types of tissues. So we have muscle tissue as well as some connective tissue and nervous tissue. Skeletal muscle fibers are the longest of all the muscle tissue types and have these obvious striations or stripes. Sometimes referred to as voluntary muscle because we have conscious control over our skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle can contract rapidly and powerfully, but it does tire easily and can become fatigued as opposed to think cardiac muscle. So cardiac muscle cannot ever become fatigued or we would die. So when muscle becomes fatigued, it becomes unable to contract. So if cardiac muscle stops contracting, then we would be dead. So skeletal muscle can become fatigued and run out of energy relatively easily. Cardiac muscle tissue is found only in the heart, making up the bulk of the heart walls. It's also striated, but it is involuntary. So we can't consciously control our heart muscle. So if we had to consciously remember to beat our heart, right, we wouldn't get anything else done all day because we would die if we got distracted and forgot to contract our heart muscle. Right, so luckily that runs on its own autonomously. So the heart has its own pacemaker kind of built in to allow the heart to contract at that steady rhythmic pace. But the nervous system can influence heart rate as well. So if you get in a fight or flight situation, your body could start producing adrenaline, which would increase your heart rate. Smooth muscle tissues found in the walls of the hollow organs like the stomach, the bladder, and some of the airways. It is not striated. It has that smooth appearance but it's also involuntary. So again, we can't control our digestive organs. So it's able to contract on its own without the nervous system stimulation. So it runs kind of automatically in the background. All muscle tissue types share the same four main characteristics though. So first is excitability or responsiveness. So these muscle cells are able to receive and respond to stimuli. Right? So stimuli in the form of neurotransmitters and action potentials uh, and electrical impulses. Contractility. So they're all able to shorten or contract when they're stimulated. Extensibility is the ability to stretch. So they are able to extend a bit and stretch and then they're also able to recoil, so they all have elasticity, so they can stretch, but they will always kind of snap back and recoil to their normal resting length. There's four important functions of muscles and muscle tissue, so primary function, of course, is movement. So all of our movement 
locomotion manipulation is due to muscle tissue. So walking, digesting, pumping blood, um, your pupils focusing and changing their diameter is all due to muscle movement. They also help us to maintain our posture and body position. So our muscles are always slightly contracted. We have some postural muscles like in our back to help keep our body supported and upright. Muscles also help to stabilize the joint. So muscle tone is important for keeping those tendons tight and taut and keeping the joint stable. Another important function of muscle tissue is heat generation. So muscles have very high metabolic activity. Um, so one byproduct of our metabolism is heat. So that's why we maintain our body temperature. So when muscle cells are increasing their activity, say during exercise, they're metabolizing more, they're going to produce more heat. Right? So this is handy if you get cold and you start to shiver when you get the chills and the shivers. That's your body trying to generate some excess heat from contracting those muscles. A few additional bonus functions of muscles include protecting some organs. Some can produce and form valves throughout the body and some blood vessels. Uh, they also control pupil size and cause goosebumps. I remember from the skin and tegumentary chapter, we talked about the erector pili muscles that pull the hairs upright and give us those goosebumps. So we said skeletal muscle is considered an organ because it's made up of different types of tissues. So it has nerve and blood supply, has some connective tissue sheaths or coverings, and connective tissue attachments like ligaments and tendons. So every muscle receives a nerve, an artery, and a vein. So our consciously controlled skeletal muscle has a nerve stimulating every single fiber to control their activity. Also, we said muscle has very high metabolic demand, so it requires large amounts of oxygen and nutrients. So we need lots of blood vessels to deliver those nutrients, as well as remove those waste products that are produced as a byproduct of our metabolism. So reviewing this figure, so we have motor neurons that are going to stimulate each muscle fiber to contract. So it will branch out and stimulate and essentially communicate with every individual muscle fiber. And then there's capillaries that surround the muscle fibers as well to deliver the necessary oxygen and nutrients and remove those metabolic wastes. So each skeletal muscle, as well as each muscle fiber, is covered in a protective connective tissue sheath. So these just help to support the cells and reinforce the muscle as a whole. So there's three layers of connective tissue sheaths starting with the outermost layer on the epimysium. So the epimysium is going to cover the entire muscle organ itself. So muscles are composed of bundles of fascicles. So if we pull out one fascicle here to look a bit closer, so the fascicle is going to be covered by the perimysium. So that's the second layer of connective tissue coverings. So then the fascicles are essentially just bundles of muscle fibers. It's just kind of like those Russian nesting dolls. So we pull out one muscle fiber, look a little bit closer. Each muscle fiber is covered by an endomysium connective tissue sheet. And then we can go even further uh, looking at muscle structure. Right? So muscle fiber is just a bundle of myofibrils. And then as we continue to look at muscle tissue and muscle structure, and we'll see the myofibrils can break down into the myofilaments, which are forming our little these little lines you can kind of see on the myofibrils. So if we're looking at the structural organization of skeletal muscle, starting from the largest to the smallest component, we would have our muscle right, composed of fascicles, fascicles composed of fibers, fibers composed of myofibrils, and then the myofibrils composed of our myofilaments. Like we said in the joint chapter, muscles attach to no fewer than two points of a bone. The insertion is where the muscle attaches to the movable bone, so the bone that's being moved right when the muscle contracts. The origin is the attachment to the immovable bone, so this is just kind of our anchoring point. 
So these attachments can be direct or indirect. So if it's a direct attachment, the epimysium of the muscle is going to be fused to the periosteum or the outer layer of the bone tissue right, or the cartilage. Right, so essentially we have just direct muscle on bone attachment. So these are common in the muscles of the skull. Most muscles are indirect attachment. So they're going to have connective tissue extensions, either in a rope-like tendon or a sheet-like aponeurosis. So most muscles will be attached to the bones by these tendons and ligaments. So an aponeurosis is essentially kind of a flat tendon. So in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. So we said skeletal muscle fibers are called fibers because they're long, thin, cylindrical cells. Because they can be so long and they have such a high metabolic demand, they contain multiple nuclei. So the sarcolemma is just the name for the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. The sarcoplasm is the technical term for the cytoplasm in the muscle cell. Some other special features and Organelles in a muscle cell include glycosomes for glycogen storage. So glycogen is the storage form of glucose. Glucose is kind of our raw energy molecule for our metabolism. They also contain a protein called myoglobin for oxygen storage. So myoglobin may sound similar to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin in the blood is what's going to bind oxygen to the red blood cells, allow them to transport those gases. Myoglobin similarly will bind oxygen for the muscle cell. So all going back to muscles having that very high metabolic demand, they always have some energy reserves in these glycosomes and our myoglobin. Some other special features of muscle cells include the myofibrils, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, shown here in blue, and the T-tubules. You see kind of run across the muscle fiber, shown in yellow. So myofibrils are these densely packed little rod-like elements within the muscle fiber. So a single muscle fiber can contain thousands of these myofibrils. And they're gonna account for about 80% of the total muscle cell volume. So they're tightly packed in here, bundled together. So we also have several mitochondria kind of interspersed throughout. So mitochondria are where ATP is made because muscle cells have high energy demands. They need lots of ATP, they need lots of mitochondria. Some features of the myofibrils include the striations or the stripes. You can kind of see here, we have like a dark stripe and a light stripe. Uh, sarcomeres which are each little box or section on the myofibril. The myofilaments, which form the striations that we'll look at, as well as the molecular composition of the myofilament, so how they interact with one another on the molecular level. So we said striation, which is the technical term for the striped appearance of muscle cells. So it's formed by the repeating series of dark and light bands along the length of our myofibrils. So the A bands are your dark bands. So within the A band, you have an H zone. It's kind of hard to see here. The H zone is the lighter region that's just in the middle of that dark A band. And then in the very center, you have the M line, right? So M line right in the middle. The I bands are your lighter regions, right? So here the filaments aren't as thick, so they're not going to show up as dark under the microscope. Within the I bands, you have the Z disc, or sometimes called the Z line. Um, so this is basically an attachment point attaching one I band to another. So the Z discs, essentially gonna mark the start and stop point of one sarcomere or one little box on the myofibril. The sarcomere is the smallest contractile functional unit of our muscle fibers. So we break down the structural organization of muscle tissue, the sarcomere and the myofilaments are kind of the end of the line. So it's gonna contain an A band with half of an I band at each end. So it's essentially the space between two Z discs. So we said the Z disc is gonna mark the start and stop of one sarcomere. So here's one sarcomere. 
here's another sarcomere, here's a third sarcomere. So these individual sarcomeres are just going to line up end to end along the length of the myofibril. The myofilaments are the arrangement of the actin and myosin within the sarcomere. So we said we had thick filaments and thin filaments contributing to that dark A band and the light I band. So the actin are your thin filaments shown here in blue. So they're going to extend across the I band and partially into that A band. They're also going to be anchored to our Z discs. Right? So again, our start and stop points anchor those thin filaments, those thin actin filaments. Myosin is the thick filament, right? so it's going to make up that darker A band because they're thicker. They're just going to block out more light and appear darker under the microscope. So these are going to extend the entire length of the A band and connect at that M line. So that M line was directly in the middle of the sarcomere. So we said the molecular composition of these myofilaments influences the way they're going to interact with one another and cause muscle contraction. So kind of at the molecular level, what's happening here. So the thick filaments we said were composed of myosin. So molecularly, they are composed of two heavy and four light polypeptide chains. The heavy chains are going to intertwine or twist together to form the myosin tail. The lighter chain proteins are going to form the myosin heads. So the heads are what's going to ultimately bind to our other filament and cause our muscle contraction. So during contraction, these heads will link together with the thin filaments, actin, and form what's called a cross bridge. The thin filament is composed of a fibrous protein called actin. So actin has these little individual subunits that contain the binding sites for the myosin. So we said the myosin heads were going to attach to the actin here at the active sites. So then these individual subunits will link together and form a long fibrous actin. So kind of like a string, a twisted string of pearls. There are also two regulatory proteins associated with actin called troponin and tropomyosin. So the tropomyosin protein is this long filament that's going to essentially cover and block our binding sites and prevent muscle contraction. So there's a special signal or key to unlock these active sites. So our secret signal, which is calcium, spoiler alert, will bind to troponin, cause it to change shape and remove the tropomyosin out of the way so then we can have our cross bridge formation and muscle contraction. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is essentially the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cell. So shown here in blue. So it kind of spans throughout the length. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum will form what's called a terminal cistern that's going to form a cross channel at our AI band junctions right, of the sarcomere, close along to that Z disc. Well, here it will join up with our T tubule shown in white. The sarcoplasmic reticulum functions in regulation of calcium in the muscle cells. So remember we said calcium was what's going to be kind of that final trigger or key for muscle contraction. So there's another signal or trigger or key to release the calcium. So there's a key to find the second key. So we'll talk about that in the next section. But sarcoplasmic reticulum essentially just stores and releases calcium to help trigger muscle contraction. The T tubules are essentially a continuation of the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane that's just going to cut across the muscle fiber. So this allows the muscle fiber to increase its surface area. It also allows those electrical impulses and nerve transmissions to reach the deep interior of each muscle fiber. So we have all of these myofibrils within this muscle fiber. So we need our electrical impulse and signal to reach all the way across to every single myofibril. So the T tubules are also going to enter the cell's interior at that AI band junction, kind of sandwiched between the terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this forms what's called a triad. So triads meaning three. So we have our T tubule, sandwiched between two terminal cisterns 
of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when an electrical impulse travels to the muscle fiber to stimulate it for contraction, right, the impulse will travel down the sarcolemma, down the cell membrane, and go into the myofibrils through the T-tubules, and it will essentially stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium. Yeah, so when an electrical impulse passes through this T-tubule, it's going to cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the calcium into the cytoplasm, which would then bind to the troponin in actin, causing it to change shape and move the tropomyosin away from the active binding sites and allow cross-bridge formation to occur.